welcome all of you tonight. Grateful that you're here with us. Those who have joined us by, with, by means of live stream, we welcome you also. Before I begin, I'd like to apologize for a number of typographical errors in this lesson. I exercised myself to avoid them, but I just was not able to do so. I just, I just fess up. <laughs> and I'm not sure why they occur. Well, I kind of have a reason, kind of have an inkling, but <coughs> this will be our 25th lesson in Amos. We'll begin, be beginning the fifth chapter tonight. <coughs> now, by way of introduction, it's extremely difficult for men, and this includes even religious, devout religious men, to think of their lives within the context of God himself. That has proved a very challenging thing to accomplish. To think of your life in the context of God, with him directing your thinking. By nature, you see, man is self-centered. And although in Christ they're delivered from the dominance of self, this is true, yet many find great difficulty correlating salvation with God-centered thought and reasoning. It, this is difficult. We, we acknowledge this is difficult. Even those who have some measure of success in this area will tell you it's not been without a lot of effort. A few people actually think, where am I going? What is God doing? How do I fit in? Am I being ethically prepared for glory? This is not a natural way of thinking at all. Under the old covenant, God established a law to kind of curb the way people thought. <laughs> it was, it was kind of like a fence, a corral. Kept you, and he kept them busy with all kind of ordinances and distinguishing meats and clean and unclean and observing feasts and he kept them busy sort of forcing them to think about what God think about God during this and what, what does God require and so forth now nature is not up to this challenge that I've been talking about at all you see, the law brought no spiritual resources to man. Yeah, that's right. It had an empty wagon. Uh -huh. yeah. When it came to supplies, that's not what the law did. Yeah. The law didn't bring you grace, didn't bring you peace, didn't bring you understanding. Those are things you had to hack out for yourself. Yeah. That's the way the law worked now. It gave you like a, a lot of tools and a kind of a vague blueprint and you had to just go to work. That's how it worked. Now for people who've been under that kind of a system, they'll tell you it's hard to shake loose from it. It's amazing how it clings to you. And Israel had this kind of... Uh, Difficulty. Brother, that's a very apt illustration. It makes me think of the psalmist asking for those very things. That's and right. Even though the, even though David in particular knew the law. That's right. But he was still asking for those very things that's that he right. spoke about. See, that's because the law it said was the deficiency wasn't alone in David. The law didn't bring sufficiency. Right. See, everybody sees that. I trust. None of the Old Testament prophets, they didn't either. But they told you what was coming. Amen. They did tell you that. Right. And how what a sweet sound that must have been, huh? Yeah. 
to people who, who were laboring under the bludgeon of the law to hear these promises about in that day they shall, you know, and that would wonderful sound to them. Now, notwithstanding this condition, God had a heart for the people. Now this is a this is an aspect of God that is also difficult to apprehend. God has feelings and they're not all bad. Right. It's going to, we're going to have an example. He's going to sing a song to Israel. A song of lamentation. There's no real adequate way to say it, but in some way God was hurt. Yeah. It was not in the sense that man is, it's a, it was a deeper sense, but God is affected yeah. when his people wander. Amen. You can almost see a tight tear in his eye yeah. and hear a shake in his voice as he talks about it. He laments their condition, as we're going to look at. The great heart of God was not unaffected by the failures of Israel. Was, there was anger, but that's not all there was. Or they never would, uh, would recover. Right. His nature would not allow him to pass over their transgressions as though they didn't exist. But he had a great heart that was still toward them. That's what this section of the book is all about. We're brought to see the grief that sin brings to God. Now, once you see this, and in your heart you understand this, that your sin grieves God, you'll live more carefully, I'll tell you that. You'll be more careful of the way you live. The thought of grieving God is... Frankly, it's frightening to me. Yeah. It sorrows God to have to deal harshly with people, with his people. He'd rather bless them. But sometimes he, uh... Well, the psalmist, he kind of sensed this through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He kind of sensed this aspect of God. And he said... Psalm 103.9, he will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger forever. Amen. See, he got a glimpse of what God's really like there, yes. which is quite amazing. No wonder he was a man after God's own heart. Most of us have to have a reason to give a, a heart felt thanks to God because this is the way he is. You, it's in order to, for you to thank God. Thank you, Lord, for being patient with me. Thank you for getting, not letting your grief turn to anger, for making a way for me to come back. That's a source of great thanksgiving for Amen. those. You invited us to come even though we were weary and heavy laden. So you, nobody really wants to come to God this way or the Lord this way. We'd rather come with joy and thanksgiving, but sometimes you're weary and heavy laden. Amen. And uh, just so you don't shrink back from that, Jesus told you to do this. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Amen. All right, here's our, here's our text. First three verses, chapter 5. Hear ye this word which I take up against you, even a lamentation, O house of Israel. The virgin is a song. The virgin of Israel is fallen. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. 
there is none to raise her up. For thus saith the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave an hundred. And that which went forth by a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. He said, I don't... This, this was difficult as defined by divine difficulty, which is different than human difficulty. This is a commentary on the God on God's Godhood. Sometimes a parent won't scold their child because they don't want to hurt him, you know. But see, God, he it hurts him too. But he does anyway. Hear ye, hear ye this, this word. What I'm saying right now, see. There comes a time when you got to stop being general about what God said. He said somewhere, you know, be very general. Hear this word or this message. Word means message. Hear means listen. Be always to the word of God like Brother Tony wants to be. He wants to hear at all times. Don't want to miss anything. In your heart, that's how you want to be God. But I don't want to miss anything. Amen. God says, here now, here. It's a particular word. It's a timely word. It's got to be heard at this time. Uh -huh. God may not speak it again. This may be the only time you hear this word. Yeah. Listen up. Now, this is the third time Israel's been admonished to hear a particular word. Hear this word. Hear this word, Amos 3.1. Hear this word, Amos 4.1. Hear this word, Amos 5.1. See, that's how God is. If you're going to doze off, don't doze off now. Amen. Hear this word. All three times the word concerns the judgment. Judgment had to be executed because of the waywardness of Israel. See, it's all three times. God just doesn't talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, talk about it. Sometimes he says, you listen, I want to say this. One time. Now, God does insist that his people listen to what he says. Amen. 415 times we are reminded, Thus saith the Lord. <laughs> it's all through scripture. Hear the word of the Lord. That's a frequent emphasis. See, in view of the, this telling emphasis that God insists that when he speaks, his people hear. This is He insists on this. Don't try and learn it second hand. In view of this, there is no acceptable reason for any of God's children being ignorant of his word. Amen. This is not acceptable under any conditions. No one should try and explain it. No one should alibi for it. No one should try and blame it on someone else. Mm -hmm. Simply is not right for the word of men to be known more extensively than the word of God. Amen. This is just not right. Hear this word, which I take up against you. Oh, Other versions say it, tone it down a little bit. New American Standard says, this word's for you. See, that's kind of knocked the edge off a little bit. Concerning you, that's the NIV. It kind of, get, kind of dulls it a little bit. I'm going to say this word over you. I'm going to pronounce it over you. That's, that's involved there. About you. I'm bearing to you. I'm bringing you a word. That's, that's still just too soft. It's too, too soft. Against you. Lifting up. I'm going to pronounce this while I'm standing over you. And it's going to be against you. That's what, what, it, that's what it means. In my judgment, some of the versions obscure this meaning. 
just as represented as just a word spoken to Israel, like this is what I have to say to you today, but it's not that kind of word. This word over you, I'm going to raise it up over you, it's like a tombstone. It's like a tombstone to Israel, like an epitaph on a tombstone. Hear this? Hear, pay attention to what I'm writing on your tombstone. That's what he's saying. I'm going to explain why things haven't been going too well. I'm going to explain it to you. This is not an expression like Sennacherib. You know, he, he wrote this verbose letter saying he could handle anybody and no other God's been able to deliver the people. And it was kind of an empty threat, but this, this is not the way God's talking at all. And his pronouncement is by an eternal God against his people. You know, some people, they can't see God this way. The reason they've been taught, they've been taught a skewed view of God they haven't been given a proper view of God. That's why people adopt these teachings that you can maybe you can see through them, but they've been taught a skewed view of God. They don't have a right view of God. So when something like this is read, they'll say, "Well, that was for the old. That was under the old cover. That's not the way God is now." What are you taking up, Lord, against the people? Even a lamentation. This is God. God's, God's given a lamentation. Other versions say, say a dirge or a requiem. After the person's dead, that when you give the dirge. The NIV says this lament. Basic Bible English says, My song of sorrow. You suppose God can sing a sorrowful song? He's going to do it. Sorrowful song. God's word says this funeral song. See, these days we've got so refined, you don't have funeral songs very often. People like to pretend everything's hunky dory during, you know. But I remember funeral songs. I was I tried to find the song, I just couldn't, but it was an old song that our brother Harold Losey came brought from the Lutheran church. And it was about confessing their sins, what grief the people had because they'd offended God. And it was asked the song asked God to help them not do that again. It was a f funeral song. Yeah. Spiritual funeral. Mm -hmm. The longest funeral song in the Bible is the Book of Lamentations. Yeah. It's a funeral song. That's what it is. 3,283 words. Now, I don't know how many verses that is, but it's a long song. Right. <laughs> when Saul and Jonathan were slain, David sang a lamentation over them. 2 Samuel 1, verses 17 through 27, that's a song in which he said, How are the mighty fallen? He sang about when Saul was somebody. That's why he was lamenting, see? When the Stephen was slain, devout men picked up his body and buried him. They just didn't send out anybody to do this. And the scripture says the church made great lamentation over him. See, not because of wrong he had done, but because of the gaping hole he left. I know people that have left this life and nobody to this day has filled in the gap they left. You probably could think of some, too. All oh, they say, but they were especially gifted. Well, two or three people should have filled it. Yeah. hundred people. Yeah. Some people, it takes a couple hundred people to fill the gap. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
But whenever a man of spiritual stature passes away, the church isn't happy. I know people say you should be happy and all that, but they just, they're blowing smoke. They don't know what they're talking about. When Moses died, they lamented for 40 days. Hard to get over it. I'm a lam lamenting. I'm a lamenting. Now, lamentation is usually when a person's dead. That's when the lamentation takes place. The men of Beth Shemesh, Philistines, looked in the ark. <laughs> Big mistake. They looked in the Ark of the Covenant, and the Lord smote the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the Ark. Even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. That's a whole lot more people that live in the Joplin area. For doing what? For looking at holy things that they weren't given license to look at. See, this we're talking about God. And what happened? What happened? The people lamented <coughs> because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. 50,000, three score and ten men. Well, the NIV says 70 men. Oh, yeah, I'm telling you the truth. The translators, I guess, couldn't. They just took the last half of the equation, 53,070. They just took, seven, what it reads? Lord slew 70 men. Even a song of lamentation I taken up, O house of Israel, house of Israel. I'm not singing about the Philistines here, I'm singing about you. Song sung by the Lord himself. Israel had become dead to him. And so he's singing a funeral song over her. Not a happy song, a lamentation. God is represented as calling upon the prophets to take up a lamentation against my people. Yeah. He wanted them, wanted them to share in the weeping. Now, you can look at the condition of the church and get angry. And sometimes that, that is an appropriate response. But don't forget to lament yeah, amen. that this condition exists. Yeah. You got an example of God. Mm -hmm. Micah prophesied in a mournful condition of, of a mournful condition of God's people. Here's what he said. In that day shall one take up a parable against you and lament with a doleful lamentation and say, We be utterly spoiled. He hath changed the portion of my people. How hath he removed it from me? Turning away, he hath divided our fields. That's a song a modern church could sing. If, it's got, if anyone has divided fields, it's... Oh, yeah, right. See, but they look at divided fields, they say, God did this. Men look at divided fields, and they say, men did this. So they can't lament. God did this. Amen. I will tell you that in Scripture, Satan doesn't divide people. He knows a house divided against itself won't stand. Satan, he's, he keeps a united front. Consistently in Scripture, Satan is the one who divides. Our God is the one who divides. Now, he did it at Babel, and he's done it at other times too. And to think that God divided his people, see, this is a lament. And God laments. For our time, we must never forget that Jesus wept over Jerusalem. He didn't jeer at it. No. He wept. He sang a funeral song over it. Luke 19, 41 through 44. It was a funeral dirge. He sang over Jerusalem. The house is going to be left desolate. 
See, that such a thing as a falling away could occur. This is a source of great sorrow. Amen. That such a thing could occur. That among the people of God, whom he delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son, that such people could fall away. This is a sad circumstance. The Lord lamented because they had it, Jerusalem had received more, did less with it. So let's go to the first verse of the song. The virgin of Israel is fallen. Other versions read the maiden of Israel. That's a new revised standard and the revised standard. God's word Bible says the people of Israel, not the virgin, the people of Israel. The living Bible says beautiful Israel, not the virgin of Israel. And the contemporary English Bible version says dearest Israel, not virgin Israel. But the word translated virgin has the following lexical meaning. Feminine passive part participle of an unused root meaning to separate a virgin. To separate. We'd say without intimate involvement with any man. That's the idea. That's what virgin means. Virgin's a proper word. The virgin Israel is fallen. Why did he say that? Why did he call her a virgin after all she had sinned? Well, when Israel started out, she did keep herself from other gods with very few exceptions. She was noted for her allegiance to God. But before many years passed, her love for God began to wane. She began to mingle with other peoples and Worship other gods. and He says the virgin of Israel has fallen. This is not how she started. Yeah, amen. <coughs> when God said they had despised him <coughs> after they'd fallen. When God said they had despised him, they barked back. How have we despised you? Oh, wow. yeah. They'd fallen. Even women <coughs> That's right. That's right. When he said that you've despised my name, they shouted back in his face, Wherein have we despised thy name? Yeah. The virgin yeah. had fallen. What a tragic uh, state. <laughs> they turned their backs on God. Jeremiah 32, 32 says they turned their back on God. Paul, that's, I'm describing the fallen state. It is actually said of them, the prophets prophesy falsely, the priests bear rule by their means, and my people love to have it so. Jeremiah 5, 31. What is that? That's the virgin fallen. That's a fallen Israel. So what about, what about today? We got, we got this situation that they prophesied. They heap on teachers on, under themselves, teachers after their own lust have an itchy ears. What is that? That's a fallen yeah. church. That's a right. fallen, a fallen church. That's what it is. Just as surely as Israel was fallen. The bride of Christ, we'd say, has fallen. Yeah. That's how God regards it now. Whereas they may say, well, yeah, but they weren't the real people. That's not how God's saying it there. Right. Yes, there is a, it is written there's an Israel within an Israel. I understand that. But see, at this point here, this is not how God reasons. <coughs> he doesn't overlook these things. He said uh, they actually robbed God. And they responded, where have we robbed thee? Yeah. Yeah, it's a fallen. <laughs> yeah. That's a fallen at the fallen virgin, it talks like that. 
Israel finally came to the point where it was said of her they love to have these perverted yeah. ways. They like it. Yeah, More convenient. Yes. Peter would say they've forgotten they were purged from the That's rest. exactly it. Mm -hmm. Exactly it. Yeah, they say to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Yeah. Ah, stop, stop telling us about right things. Yeah. Speak to us of smooth things and prophesy to cease. Make us feel good. We don't want to come to church and feel bad. God would say, well, then start doing good. Start seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And Amen. I got good stuff to say to people like that. Yes. Amen. Fallen. They had become so alienated to God that he'd ceased to hold them up. That's why they fell. God can keep people from falling, but not that kind of people. His nature won't let him do it. You see what I'm trying to say here? is that people try and blame the falling away on this person, that personality, so on, so on, so on, so on. But a falling away is the fault of the people who fell away. Amen. They at some point, Amen. at some point, they stop listening to God. Amen. And God sings this song of lament, lamentation over them. The first century church included some congregations that were not ideal. All of them weren't like this, but there were some like this. There was Corinth, Ephesus, Pergamos, Thyatira, Laodicea, and many churches in the region of Galatia. They all had a legitimate start. All of those churches had a legitimate start. The churches that are the devil's churches have never had a proper start. They, they aren't they can't fall, but they never, they never got out of the pit. Yeah, that's right. These are people that got out of the pit now. Uh -huh. yeah. They were delivered. And so when Christ addressed the church, he included these flawed, he included them. We stand among the churches, Laodicea, Pergamos, Thyatira, Ephesus, they were part of those churches. It was churches. He included them, see. When he said Israel has fallen, he doesn't mean every single Israelite fell. I mean, as a whole, it fell. There come a time early on in the history of the church when flawed churches were the exception, not the rule. But as time progressed, flawed churches became the rule and not the exception. And at that point, the virgin is fallen. Yeah. Yeah. Judah, yes. Sin is a choice. God is not responsible for the sin that you choose to commit. God has given you everything that you need to not sin. And sinning is not only a slap in the face to say that God is responsible for it. It's not right. And God... God, God knows if you think that falling away is not your fault. Yeah. People fall away and say, oh, it's not, it's not my fault. God didn't give me enough to thrive on, but yes, he did. He did, that's he right. He did. Mm -hmm. Amen. It yeah, is. When God lets go of a person, that was preceded by an extraordinary amount of long-suffering and patience and this exhortation and admonition and... An extraordinary amount of that preceded this condition. They have fallen. I said, they'll no more rise. The virgin Israel fell, no more rise. For Israel, at least that generation, they would not regain their position. Several generations actually have been, were included in this judgment. Judah managed to get back to Canaan. Israel never did to this day. The only thing that's going to remedy Israel's situation is when God turns ungodliness away from Jacob. That's the only thing that's going to remedy this. They're not going to rise. 
So there's been whole generations. It's been a remnant that's not included in this. Understand, we're, there's been a remnant that's not been included, but it's been a very, very small. Left is a very small remnant. But the size of the remnant doesn't make a difference. It was, a remnant keeps the race alive. <coughs> she shall rise no more. She's forsaken upon her land. Like, she's been abandoned in her land. Her, even her city, Jerusalem, where I put all the resources, they're in such a condition they can't get any of them. They can't get at them. She's fallen. She's not going to rise again in her land. I suppose we'd say today they're falling in, right in church, you know, where you should be able to get, yeah, that's right. get things. The blessing of the Lord was upon the land, but they couldn't get any of it. See, it's possible a person can be where the Spirit of God's being poured forth, all kind of insights are being ministered, gifts of God are operative, and there are people that cannot get anything out of that. They've fallen. Now, the task of everybody is don't be that kind of person. Everybody on the day of Pentecost wasn't converted. Just a very small percentage of who was there, 3,000 people. Yeah. They tell us the population went up to as high as 5 million during the Passover. Yeah. So if there were 5 million, 3,000, that's kind of, a, kind of a small. Of course, it was a first fruits harvest. Right. It was a sample beginning harvest. Everybody wasn't converted. A lot of people, I imagine more than 3,000 people heard what Peter said. But 3,000 believed. It sounds like a big number to us, but that's just because we're living in a great falling away. That wasn't really that big a number in those days. The next sermon preached, 5,000 men alone believed. Didn't even count the, <laughs> didn't even count the women and children. 5,000 men Believe. So you got two sermons and 8,000 men already. See that? So it sounds like a lot to us, but it was, it was a small percentage of actually who was there. She's forsaken upon her land. Now, brethren, it's, it is a sad day when someone that walked with God can't get anything out of the Bible can't go to any service where they can get something. I don't, there are people like this now. Don't doubt, don't doubt this for a minute. There's people that can sit at the table. Jesus is through the Lord's table, and there's Judas when they sat down, and there's Judas when they got up. Yeah, that's right. Didn't get a single thing from what Jesus said up to that point. That's a, that's a depiction of a fallen condition. You might think if we could just get so and so here. Well, of course that that's better than not being here. We un we understand that. But if a person is in a fallen condition, which God knows, fallen in the sense of our text, I'm talking about, they can't be recovered, can't get up, can't help themselves. Well, he says, "Here's how the Lord said." There is none to raise her up. The virgin Israel is fallen. She is no more. She shall no more rise. She is forsaken upon her land. There is none to raise her up. Yeah. Word went out from the throne. Yeah. Don't lift that person up. Amen. You think there are people like that? Yes. Oh, yeah. Alexander the coppersmith, he's that kind of person. Esau is that kind of person. Uh -huh. Judas is that kind of person. Hymenius and Pharisees is that kind of person. You see why God laments this? 
This is a condition that uh, God doesn't take delight in. We have a similar yet a worse state in our time. <coughs> in fulfillment of apostolic prophecy within the church, corrupt leaders have surfaced, heaping disciples unto themselves, and as a result of falling away has occurred. Professing Christians have departed from the faith. Just like the apostles said they would. Some cannot endure sound doctrine. They just can't. They just don't like it. That's all there is to it. And so they gather teachers to themselves after their own desires. It'll say what they want to have heard. What is that? That's a fallen, that's a fallen virgin. That's what that is. We now have a large theological valley that's full of dry bones. They're not united bones either. They're scattered. They lie helpless in a place that was intended for blessing. There they lie. These dry bones. They went to the psychiatrist for help when they haven't been able to help them. They've gone to the motivational experts for help. They haven't been able to help them. They've gone to behavioral practitioners and they haven't been able to help them. They've gone to professional counselors and they haven't been able to help them. Why? Why not? Why not? Why have all these failed? Why haven't these people that have been so successful in the business world flunked in the church? Why? Because God has decreed none. Amen. None can raise them up. Now, brethren, it's worth every effort you put out to stay out of that category. Amen. God's given us what we need to stay out of that category. And Satan, he's working overtime. He's got a larger range of work, a well, larger work area now because of this falling away. See, the falling away occurred because God withdrew. Yeah, uh -huh. <coughs> God continues to comment on this in his song. He's, he's singing this song. <laughs> now tell me, do you like to, would you like to think about God singing this song over you? And angels are hearing him singing it. See, there's a heavenly host that heard him singing. Oh, it must have caused weeping and lamentation among the angelic hosts. Yeah. Uh -huh. Why, some of those angels had delivered Israel, yeah. Amen. saved them, mm -hmm. slew their enemies, brought miraculous food to them. Some of those angels were busy caring for Israel. Don't think they were all dry-eyed when this song was of lamentation was sung by God himself. Amen. Thus saith the Lord God, the city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred, and that which sent forth by a hundred shall leave ten to the house of Israel. Or now, it's, hope, it's hopeless, but it's not utterly hopeless. We're still going to have a hundred to work with in a, in a big city and ten to work with in a little city. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're going to comment on a remnant now. Thus saith the Lord God, the phrase, thus saith the Lord, that's 415 times that phrase is mentioned in the scripture. For those who are living by faith, it is a most important expression. Yeah, yeah. Thus saith the Lord... Thus saith the Lord, it precedes the ultimate clarification. Yeah. Thus saith the Lord, it takes the precedence over all competing or contradicting statements. Amen. Mm -hmm. Thus saith the Lord, it's the prelude to important instruction that you need. Thus saith the Lord. Whatever is declared by such words takes the precedence over everything else. 
because it, man lives by every word of God. So when you say, thus saith the Lord, that's a word from God. Amen. And you're going to live by that word. Now he says, <laughs> there's going to be a, a tenth that's not going to be affected by this uh, judgment. The city that went out by a thousand shall leave a hundred. That's a, that's a, that's a tenth. Right? And that which went out by a hundred shall leave ten. That's a tenth. Yeah. Now, there's two possible meanings of the text. One is, it could mean that the city that was accustomed to sending out a thousand warriors would, would send out a thousand, but only a hundred would come back. Or it could mean that one that used to send out a thousand would only be able to send out a hundred. And some of the ver different versions line up behind these two. So you went out one went out with a thousand, but nine hundred of hundred of them were killed. I'm going to come back with a hundred. Or sent out a hundred, ninety of them were killed. Came back with ten. Now, I'm going to say it that that's not what that means. Because we're talking about a remnant. Yeah. If that is what this means, either they only went out one time, or pretty soon there's not going to be a remnant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Next time they go out, they go out 100 and come back with 10. They go and go out 10 and come back at 1. Yeah. Pretty soon there isn't any remnant. See, but this, that can't mean what this means. Yeah. The idea is that you're only going to have this many people to send out. You used to be able to fight with a thousand men. But now that the virgin Israel has fallen, you're only going to fight with a hundred men. You say, well, a hundred can do more than a thousand. Under, under certain circumstances, that is true. This is the remnant. He's talking about a remnant. You're going to have to be, now the things of God and the cause of God is going to have to be maintained by a remnant. Yeah. Everybody's not going to be involved like they were before. Now there's various perspectives to the remnant. Who, who, are, who is this remnant? God talks about them in a variety of ways. Here's nine of them. He that departeth from evil. As, as a remnant. They that feared the Lord, it's a remnant. The remnant that are left, <laughs> the remnant of mine inheritance, him that is of a contrite and humble spirit, that's a remnant, see, that's a remnant. Them whose heart is perfect toward him, him that is poor and of a contrite spirit and trembleth at my word. Them that are of a broken heart, such as be of a contrite spirit. See, those, that's describing the hundred or the ten. Now, when judgment comes when the Almighty and the remnant's left, that doesn't necessarily mean the remnant's going to fight all the battles and win them all. Yes, that's God can, can do that, but that, I don't think that's the idea of a remnant. Sometimes the remnant has to hide. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> they, they can't fight, they hide. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, God told Elijah, you know, there's yeah. 7,000 haven't bowed the knee. Yeah. Nobody knew where they were or who they were. Mm -hmm. And that Obadiah one that took a hit, hit a 700 prophets hid them. So sometimes the remnant has to hide. Sometimes they're not out in the open. Also, when the remnant's made known, they become a prey. Mm -hmm. right. Says the one that departs from evil makes himself a prey. Mm -hmm. So, so now the, the spiritual hawks are out after you. Yeah. Uh -huh. Out after the fowls. The remnant often live in a time when the truth is fallen in the street. As Isaiah 59, 
14 says, and the truth fails. There's just not a lot of truth being said. And truth doesn't have any, it lacks its power that ordinary had fallen in the street. Why? The virgin Israel is fallen. See, this is, why do you think the word of God doesn't appear to have a lot of power in this day? It's because the church has fallen. Yeah, amen. Mm -hmm. That's why. Its power has been, de it's been deprived of power. Yeah. Now, some people say they have an answer. They say, well, God doesn't do things like that anymore. That's their theology. I was taught this. This is their theology. God doesn't do things. That was just for the beginning of the church. But in God's kingdom, the beginning is always the lesser thing, not the greater thing. Isn't that true? Despise not the day of small things, because it's not going to stay small. In God's kingdom, the little bitty stone becomes a mountain that fills the whole earth. Yes. Well, that's the point that you brought out about this remnant being a tenth. Mm -hmm. Because whenever I think of a tenth, I think of the tithe. Well, right. the tithe is the Lord's portion. That's right. And so when we think of the remnant here, the remnant is the Lord's portion. Amen. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. good. The remnant was kept in the storehouse, you know. <laughs> the tithe was kept I mean, in the storehouse. Yeah, so they were protected. <coughs> so if the assessment that I have made is true, that we are living in the midst of a famine of hearing the word of God, which means the virgin has fallen. Because the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. So if there's a famine of hearing the word of God, it means the pillar has fallen down. The pillar that held it up has fallen down. That's what the problem is. So now, surviving, that's the thing. Surviving is the thing. Getting through this is, is the thing. That's the thing of top priority, making it through this critical time yes. finding a brook mm -hmm. where there's water and the ravens can feed you finding a widow that can sustain you see the main thing is surviving yes. that's the main thing mm -hmm. in the process you don't close your mouth there's, yeah. you'll be given opportunities to preach the gospel to every creature you understand but if you you must survive yes. that's the point <laughs> the remnant that's all that's left. Yeah, but this remnant can flourish and grow. Yes. It can rocket from 70 to 3 million yeah. in the enemy's land. <laughs> now, this is not to mention their own. So, I, I exhort you to be like Joshua and Caleb. Survive the wilderness. Amen. I mean, every day wasn't pleasant those 40 years. See, but Joshua and Caleb, they survived. They survived. Amen. I can't, I, th I know that they told some of the younger ones that grew up, hang in there, mm -hmm. hold on. We just got 20 more years to go. Yeah. Oh, I know that, I know that that's the way God's people are. If we're living in the last days, hold on, hold on, just a little longer. Amen. Yet a little while, he that shall come will come, will not tarry. Hold on, hold on. Be satisfied to be part of the hundred and the ten and the thousand and the hundred. Right? Well, it, I got a lot out of that text. It, it impressed me how zealous God is to maintain his cause and his work. He'll not let his people be annihilated or completely extinguished because his purpose revolves around his working with them. So in my opinion, we are living in a rejected generation. That doesn't mean everybody's rejected. It's a rejected generation. See, during this time, there were holy men that survived this. Survived this. But I think we're living in a rejected generation. I don't know how else you could account for 
the spiritual depravity that exists and the spiritual ignorance. I don't know how well you could account for it. But the condition should make us sad. If God laments, how much more us? Maybe, maybe you're old enough. You can remember where times were better. People were a little more sensitive. They're a little more familiar with Scripture. Now you face a time when it's changed. Learn to sing the Song of Lamentations. Nehemiah's day, they sung the song. Remember? They, they sung the song. They lamented. Told about how they were. Daniel, he sung the song. He sung the lamentation song. And it'll help you survive. If you're hurt by less than an ideal situation, you'll be alert enough to take advantage of some opportunities that may arise. Maybe there'll be a widow. <laughs> You'll be able to raise her son from the dead. That was during that was during that time. That was a time of blessing for that widow. Right. God will give comfort. That's right. Another example of the thing that counts is to be counted with esteem by God. Yeah. Amen. 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 Yeah, like how you brought out the, the point that the remnant can grow. The remnant mm -hmm. doesn't stay the size that it might yeah. originate as. Mm -hmm. Thought of the mustard seed, the parable that Jesus told about a seed that is, is the size of about a fifth of a grain of rice. If you could cut up a grain of rice, the mustard seed would be about a fifth. Yeah. It's not <laughs> that big. Impressive, is it? It's not big. You can plant a peach seed... It's it's a good size and get a tree that's not as big as the one that you would get when you plant a mustard seed. Yeah. So the, even though the mustard seed is the epitome of small beginnings, it's also the epitome of seeing that big things can come out of small beginnings if God is in it. Now Abraham, I was I don't I can't calculate off the top of my head how many years is from Abraham through Jacob, but it's, we're in the hundreds. We you know, hundreds of years, and at the end of that period, it looked like a very, it was just a remnant of humanity. It was just a 70. Yeah, that's right. But look what God did to that 70. Jacob was the 17 when Abraham died. Mm. All right. If I remember correctly. Mm. So here's 150, 134 when he went into Egypt. Right? Mm. So it's over 100 years. Isn't yeah. It? So, yeah. So there, uh, God will have no trouble breathing life into a valley dry bones. <laughs> and I want to be ready when it these bones. Here's a, I want you to preach to these bones. To preach to bones. Got to get a good preacher. You got to learn to preach to bones. Preach to these bones. Tell these bones that God said, I'm going to raise you up. I'm going to put flesh on you, sinews on you, skin on you. I'm going to breathe life into you. Then learn to preach to corpses. Remember the bone came together. with scattered bones. They all came together, individual skeletons. The body's running, but they were still dead. He said, now it's time to come to preach to the wind. Come and breathe. That's all God's got to do. Yeah. Breathe on these slain. Watch what he did on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. That's what he did. He breathed on the slain. Amen. They stood up. <laughs> so anyway, live in anticipation of that, brother. Yeah. Yes, Sister Tasha. I mentioned a couple of different times about uh, the Lord is the same. He's the same now. He responds the same, yeah. the same now. And and we have these writings, and the, under the old covenant, we have these writings so that we know 
how God responds to different things. Amen. We know how he responds to sin, and we know how he responds to faithfulness. Mm. And if we hadn't had these writings, oh, yeah. then would, we wouldn't know. How would we know? And I remember being among the number that thought that God had changed. Now that Jesus has come, God, is, God has changed, but he hasn't changed. Not mean anymore. Yeah. yeah, he's. <laughs> that's right. That's that's right. But but God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. And we give thanks for for these writings. Yeah, we're. Yeah. I know this is true of all of you. Maybe at some time, unless you just had a disciplined methodology of studying the Bible, where you were exposed yourself to the old prophets just out of a routine of reading. But you must remember when they all of a sudden came alive to you. And you saw God in them, and you saw God working, and you saw how God's mind was. Now here tonight, we've been introduced to a lamenting God. And it helps you understand why Jesus wept over Jerusalem, see? It helps you understand this, this was not an act. This is really how he felt. Yeah. Yes. Thanks that um, the Lord that He talks so much about this remnant in the Scriptures, and how He gives us hope to know that in the wicked times that we live in, that there is a remnant, and not just that, but that we can be a part of this remnant. Mm. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Sam. Um, sinners need to turn their sinners need to turn their spiritual ears on. If they do, they'll hear God's word. They'll hear God's word. And when their spiritual ears are off, they're missing out on a lot of good things. And those good things are the words of God and people. And people who are God's words. Yes, that's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I know, you, uh, people, you know, every once in a while you talk, talk to somebody and you're trying to convince them of something and you look in the scripture and you, you come across one of these, thus saith the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> and so you think, I got it. All right, I'm just going to go, I'm going to tell them this now. That'll take care of it. And you tell them and they're like, well, well but that doesn't mean that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and, but you, you thought this was going to solve it. We have a direct word from God. It's like, but, but that isn't what that it's means. It's not for us. No. It, so, but, uh, yeah. you know, this this text you just gave today, this could tell you why. Yeah. You know, the, the, not every not everybody's just going to receive the Bible as the Word of God. Oh, no, Jesus mm -hmm. said, "He that hath ears." Yes, that's right. Now let him hear. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Brother Ricky. Yeah, the remnant in Malachi's day, they taught us exactly how to survive. That's yes. right. That's Amen. right. They met together often, and they thought and talked yes. about the name of the Amen. Lord. Amen. And that's, Amen. That's how we're going to yeah. survive too. Survival Amen. technique. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Look how we've been called into the work. Now, you are very sensitive to the banner of truth, brother, yeah. tonight. Why? Because the Lord laid it on your heart. Yeah. Why? Because they needed that. Yeah. Now, how many times have they lifted us up? That's they, exactly this right. A, the, the Lord, he's keeping this. These remnants are, are they're feeding off each other. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Melissa? I'm thankful to see this part about God being a lamenting God. Yeah. And it uh, made me think on uh, when sin entered in. If yeah. he wasn't a lamenting God, then he would not have lamented the condition that sin That's brought right. into the world That's and right. gave a remedy for it. That's right. You know, mm -hmm. so I'm That's a good point. He wouldn't have brought a remedy right. if he hadn't have lamented. Right. That's, That's right. Amen. That's so, right. So it's good to know this aspect of him. Yes. Amen. I was also considering that, like nature being in his people, today, I know I'm tempted, whenever I see the fallen nature of the church today, I'm tempted to be frustrated and angry. Mm. Mm. Oh, yes. But whenever you have this lamenting spirit, you mentioned it, you see opportunities that you otherwise would miss. That's right. Yeah. yeah. It tempers your spirit. That's right. Yeah. And then there are some people, you, well, there are some people that they are, to complain all the time, and I've got to guard against myself just being that way. And they'll they'll bring this out in you. Uh, yeah. uh -huh. We don't want to be known as if there's anything you want to know about what's wrong, just tell us. We'll tell you. Yeah. You know we. <laughs> That's right. This isn't the best mode to be in Amen. because it inf it inflames yeah. you. 
And so if you have this lamenting spirit, you grieve because the condition that, that keeps that fire down, see? Yeah. Yes? And compassion are not going to be met out apart from some yeah. amount of lamentation. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Amen. Yeah. This lamenting, too, um, shows an aspect of God's holiness. That's right. Um, Amen. Because he was lamenting that they could they could have not fallen. I mean, there, <laughs> there is a provision. We know they didn't have Christ at that time, but... but um, there is a provision made that no one has to fall. That's right. No one has to... to, to he speak. sent the prophets right. to them early. Yeah. So, I mean, Amen. in that, too, it's lamenting yeah. that they didn't take mm -hmm. advantage of the situation. Right. Yeah. What more could I have done? Yeah, that was a song of... That's Amen. a lamentation, yes, too. That's right, yeah. So I planted a noble vine, you know, yes. that, that was Amen. a lamentation. Huh? That was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sister Debbie? Yeah, I, I'm very thankful to hear that this part of the Lord just right there now yeah. discussing. Because I think it's like night and day how the people that we will be speaking to will notice that. Oh, so yes. That mercy and that grace and that concern yeah. uh, of lamentation for their souls. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That, that is the determining factor for those who will respond and come out. I know that they won't all, but... I think that's a very, very important aspect. Amen. It the is. The Lord has shown us that tonight. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If a person doesn't think you care about them, mm -hmm. they're not apt to listen, are they? Yeah. 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 That's right. Is yeah. someone over here? Okay. Amen. You know, Brother Gavin, I, I, you know, I wouldn't want to take away at all from, from our lamentation of this time we're living in. But if it's tr if it's really true that God would rather show mercy than sacrifice, He'd rather be good than show wrath. Then if you're living at a time yeah. where many seem to be fallen, wouldn't that be quite an opportunity for people that are sensitive to receive from the Lord? You know, oh, absolutely. You can, you can distinguish yes. yourself then in a time like this. Then. Yes. They that feared the Lord's yeah, faith right. and uh -huh. the Lord hearkened. So it becomes an opportunity. If that's you are right. sensitive, it becomes an opportunity because because it becomes an outlet for the Lord to that's extend Lord's His accurate. mercy and His goodness. Okay. Give a, give the Lord an opportunity to be joyful. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. That's right. I found a man. Yeah. He's looking. Says he's looking for. That's right. Yeah. Looking for a man uh -huh. to show himself strong on his behalf, who fear him. So. And he won't miss. He won't. He won't miss any of them. Yes, amen. All right. We'll have a closing word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the the scope of Revelation and how you've extended yourself to make yourself known. And this has been an especially invigorating perspective that we've seen tonight of of a holy and jealous God lamenting over the condition of his people. Our Father, we would, we would ask that you give us grace to fellowship with you in this kind of lamentation. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>